What's going on, everybody? I'm your host, Drew Walsh. Welcome to the Dig It Podcast. Today's a special one for me, at least, man. Today we got Andrew Turner. And uh, just this why it's so, so special is when I got done playing at LIU Brooklyn, I had the luxury to stay on staff and coach for a few more years as a graduate assistant um, so I could figure out life, right? I had no idea what I wanted to do. I had two more years to figure it out, and what better way to stay involved with baseball? So during that that time, some of my responsibilities were to go out and recruit, right? Like, I just got done playing. Now I had to go recruit, and I'm sitting there like, I got to go look for players to bring into this program. I just got done playing. My cleats are still in my backpack. Um, but the biggest thing for me was like when I wanted to go recruit, I was like, who would I love to play with? Like, let me look for guys who I would enjoy playing with that I could trust to have my back. And long story short, I'm out at, I think it was like Rye, New York. And I'm sitting there like, this is like game 84. This is like day two. And I'm with my former graduate assistant coach, Joshua McDonald, who is out at UConn right now. And He's like, hey, Walsh, Walsh, come over here. I'm like, what's up, coach? And uh, he's like, I think I got a guy for LIU. I'm like, really? Because I haven't found one this weekend. And he's like, yeah, yeah, I got one. Come over. So I walk over there, and, I, and I'm and i watching the Philadelphia Reds play, and I see this third baseman. Um, he's got great actions. He's loving the game. He's vocal. He's communicating with everybody. Um, I was like uh, instantly attracted to the, this player, right? I had no idea who the person was. And uh, – that's where it all started, man. And, and fortunately, he was my first and only recruit ever. And we signed him to play at LIU. Had an amazing career. And this is where I'm going to tap you in. Andrew, welcome to the podcast. What's going on, guys? Thanks for having me, Drew. No, it's a very special story. My my family and I still talk about it all the time and everything you did for us and got the ball rolling and introduced me to Coach Noto and Coach Mains and got me into LIU, which is I mean, a little biased, but one of the most special places. I think you could play college baseball in downtown Brooklyn and four of the best years of my life and got got the ball rolling in my career and was lucky to play for a long time because of guys like you in my corner and everybody else I met along the way who kind of gave me the tools I needed to succeed in Brooklyn and and pass that. So that was an awesome day up in up in Ryan, New York. That was a great day. I'm so happy I, I hung hung for that last game. But let, let's not discount the fact like I don't think you had 40, 50 offers going into college, right? How many offers did you have? Division one, LIU is my only one. Um, so let's let's just unravel that to for some of the younger kids that like you had one offer because one person was in the right spot at the right time to see someone who saw value in you. Um, and and let's man, like you had a lot of people to help you, but dude, you grind it, right? Like. When I recruited you, if we're being honest, I wasn't like, hey, Andrew Turner is going to be a – he's going to be a draft guy, like, without a doubt. Like, James Jones, I'm saying that. Like, I, that guy's going to play an MLB. Andrew Turner was a, a, a solid, really, really good baseball player. That I was like, he's going to really help our program out. He's going to be a really good college player. And if he plays after that, that's sick. Dude, let's talk about that right now. Like, you grinded for four years, right? You entered day one, Andrew Turner, like everyone else does, with zero 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 next to your name, right? Whatever you did prior to that, no one, no one really cares, right? That that got you to where you are, which is great. You know that, like you care about that. But there's a lot more that works, more work that's going to be have uh, to be put in moving forward, right? So talk talk about that. Like you did get drafted. You might want to mention that. Yeah. So no, you're definitely right. I was a late bloomer. I think my whole life in baseball would always kind of set me apart was I I had such a passion for the game that I would I always felt like I studied it more than everybody else like growing up I would not miss a Phillies game I watched every game uh studied every player read books and I always just I was always a late bloomer so I was behind the eight ball in high school in terms of physical development you know made varsity my sophomore year just because I had a great tryout but I never played my junior year I cracked the starting lineup but I was hitting ninth so for a kid who wanted to play Division One baseball, things weren't exactly going well later in my high school career. I played well, but no college coach comes to watch the nine hitter play if 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 you want to get looks. And but I was always studying the game. I always felt like my baseball IQ was there. I just needed to kind of catch up. And I was raised in a family where you just worked hard. From my grandparents down to my parents, I was just around people who worked hard and grinded and um, had a really loving support system. 
and I was very blessed in the fact that no goal I ever had was laughed at. It was always supported. So when I said I wanted to play Division One baseball, I was like, all right, let's go. Let's do it. Or when I was at LIU, if I told my family I wanted to get drafted, like, all right, let's go. Let's do it. And they would be honest with me, you know, like what you're doing now is not going to get you there. If, if you want to play D1 baseball, let's lay it out. Like you need to do this, 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 and this. And um, I just fell in love with that process. So I started playing for the Philadelphia Reds my junior year in the off season. And I told them day one of my goal is to play division one baseball. And they were skeptical because they looked at me across the table and saw who I was and how much of a gap I had to close in such little time. But I always just knew if you just stack one day and one day, one day, one day, it, it adds up long term. So I never looked at it like I want to get drafted or I want to play division one baseball. I had those dreams and I would, you know, write it on on the wall in my room on a post a note, but I would never like look at that day in, day out. For me, it was just how do I out compete? How do I get better than that guy today and just stack those days one day at a time? So just kind of like the head down, eyes up mentality and just I'm gonna have a better day than you today. Um then I'm gonna do the same thing tomorrow and um that's what I think kind of got me that's what closed the gap in high school and, and got me just in the door at LIU um and then at LIU was the same thing I was never scared of that task to take that on so I got to LIU and it was like starting over um because at Conestoga where I played in high school I got there and all these guys are better than me but all right I'm just slowly gonna work hard work hard work hard and catch you and I got to LIU and I was like all right I'm starting completely over like some of these guys like Mark Hernandez and Tommy Jakubowski, you guys are way better than me. But I know my goal in the back of my mind is I love you guys and we're going to win together, but I'm going to catch you just one day at a time. I'm going to work harder than you today. I'm going to work harder than you tomorrow. And those guys all work or work courses too. So I was around guys who taught me how to work. Um, but I just knew I could catch guys like that. And then I could catch guys on other teams and I could catch guys who were playing in the SEC. So for me, it was just, Kobe Bryant had a quote. He said, being great's very simple. Um, work harder than everybody else, more often than everybody else. And I heard that quote in high school. I just kind of took it to heart, you know, like, and he would talk about um, just like getting 1% better than everybody else every, every day and the compound effect. If I get this much better than you today and this much better than you tomorrow and just add that up over 365 days, the gap just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And um and it's funny because I would have – people would say to me – I remember one time one of my teammates in high school said to me our senior year in, like, the middle of the season, he was like, Turner, like, he was like, when did you get good? Like, when did this happen? <laughs> uh, I remember I was like, I got good when you guys were all off, like, having doing all your stuff and slacking off or doing normal high school things, and I just locked myself in, in the gym or the batting cage for the whole off season. And I feel like the same thing kind of happened in college. My freshman and sophomore year, I was not good. I was good enough to be on the team, but – I hit 210 as a freshman, 250 as a sophomore. And um, in my junior year is when I first got drafted. And it was the same kind of thing. Like, where did this come from? Um, and it was just through stacking day after day after day behind the scenes. And um, so I feel like the intangibles that I learned just from the people I had in my corner growing up taught me those things. And then just finally, after stacking enough days together in high school and then in college, you were able to get to where you wanted to be. But um, to that point, Andrew, man, like there's so much gold in there that I want to unravel. Just to start with the stack, stack, stack. Like, you know, we both read a lot of books. You think about Atomic Habits. Um, and then, and you think about gold. Goals are incredible. I, I always, you know, recommend or inspire kids to have goals. But goals are great, right? Goals, if you're just looking up to the sky, you want to reach them because at least if you're going that way, you're going to fail forward. But I think more importantly, what, I, what I've what i noticed with kids and what I try and voice and explain is that what are your standards like on Monday, on Tuesday, on Wednesday, on Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then again, right? So to your point, like, let's set goals. Let's go play Division One. Let's play in the MLB. But then let, let's backtrack. Like, let's look at what the heck we got to do behind that goal to get there because we got to create a bridge or a ladder that's going to even allow us to even flirt with accomplishing that goal. So youth, college, even pro, like you pro, you enter the, enter the, the stadium now. Now you got to get to, you got like three or four more levels to get through. So what are you doing on Monday? That's going to help you. It might just be you going watching some Lindor videos, right? Or some infield instructional videos. Tuesday might be a hand path day. Wednesday might be more of a footwork day. Thursday might be live rep. Like, 
practicing three times a week with travel ball or your high school, that's just the ticket to get into the stadium. That, that's the bare minimum. Andrew is out there every single day before and after practice. And it, it, that's the input that he put in. And then there's a different output than the kids who didn't have the same input. So I love that so much because so many kids right now that we train are coming in on, on Monday after a weekend tournament. Hey, I went seven for 13. I went eight for nine. I didn't make any errors. I'm like, great. Did, did you hit the ball hard, Jeff? Like, did you win? Like, did you, were you a good teammate? Did you have good at bats? Did you have good reads on ball? I don't care. Like you could have seven duck farts. Did you get better? I don't know. How old are you? 11? You went seven. Who cares? Just get better. Like, why are you worrying about this stuff? Because their identity is so closely attached to, to baseball and, and themselves a sense of self that like what happens next week when you go over 13, are you a bad human being? No, you had a bad weekend. Who cares? Go work harder. Yeah. No, I think you're right. And for me to touch on the goals thing, I always think Mark Hernandez actually said this to me at LIU one time. He said, if your goals don't scare you, said if your goals don't scare you, they're not big enough. Like essentially if people aren't laughing at your goals, they're not big enough. And even today where I'm at in my life now in high school and college and, and now today, like, my goals make my stomach turn. They always have like my freshman year when I would tell people like I wanted to get drafted, it would make me like want to throw up. Cause I'm like, I know I want it, but I have no idea how I'm actually going to get there. But I firmly believe in like, if you shoot for the moon, you might land at the stars. Like I'm not like, even if, like you, I would never think this way, but if I set my goal to getting drafted and like, let's say I don't right. At least I gave it everything I had and maybe I became all conference. But if I say oh, I'm not going to get drafted, what's the point of trying? Then I'll never even be a good college baseball player. And I was lucky enough to hit some of those goals. But and from that, like you're saying, you have to backtrack because you need to turn your goal into an action plan. So, OK, that's the goal. Anybody can just say it. But what, turn, what the difference between a goal and a wish is that the goal actually has a plan in place to get you there. So, OK, I like I like your how you said like a ladder. I always thought of it as like a giant staircase. And like at the top of the staircase was like playing Division One baseball. And there's 10,000 steps between me and there. And first step is like dominating Monday. Well, that step might even be, there might even be 10 steps before that. Like wake up at 7 a.m., eat a healthy breakfast, work out, hit, okay, I dominated Monday. And then you just go to Tuesday. So I always looked at it as just thousands and thousands of little steps that I could just check off and keep hitting. And then you open your eyes one day and you're like, wow, I'm an all-conference third baseman. I couldn't even get off the bench a year and a half ago. And it's just because you just – And to that point, Andrew, I just want to say like, and, and a lot of, and I had a kid, and you just said it, and I had a kid recently sign a Division One scholarship, and we're sitting there talking. It was a couple of months back. We're foam rolling, getting ready for a lift, and he's like, "Man, it all just happened so fast, like one day." And I'm like, "And and to you, because I know you're going to talk about how you had one really good game, and one scout saw you play." Um, but if we're being serious, and I I I interrupted right away, and I said, "No, it didn't." That happened 15 years ago when you've been working your butt off. That happened 15 years ago because you put in the work for the last 15 years. Don't think that happened today because you're going to need more of that to get where you want to go in the future. And and, and I want you to elaborate, talk about like, hey, you had a pretty good weekend on Bryant. And it just so happened someone was there. Yeah, maybe it was luck, but you you put you put in the work to even uh, give yourself a chance to get lucky. Yeah, it's funny. They, I think I want to say it was with like uh, Joe Burrow, right? When he went to LSU, he was a back of at Ohio State, and then he goes to LSU, had one of the best seasons in college football history, and the media was calling it an overnight success. And he said, he said, none of this happened overnight. I've been working my butt off for 23 years. He's like, this is the furthest thing from overnight. This was countless days stacked together. But so the other people, to your point, it looks like overnight success, but it's, it's not. It's just days and weeks and years of stacking together good habits that allow you to be ready for that moment when it arises. And that's kind of what happened at Bryant. Um, I feel like Bryant that weekend, my junior is kind of when other people kind of like, not just my team, because everybody at LIU had such a good belief in each other, but other people outside our program kind of began to know who I was, but we were playing Bryant. They had James Karen on the mound, who's supposed to be a first rounder. He got hurt. So we ended up going in like the fifth to 10 round somewhere in there. And still currently one- today. Currently one of the best pitchers in the MLB for the Guardians. And there are like 50 scouts there, the most scouts you would ever see uh, at an NEC baseball game or probably will ever see again. But <laughs> he was up to like 98 that year. They played Arkansas that year. I think he beat him or almost beat him, but he was up to 98 just a couple weeks before that. And I remember we were walking up to the 
field from that bus. You have that long walk from the bus to Bryant's field. And I was next to Luis Arias and we saw all the scouts kind of talking to him and the coach before the game. And Arias said something along the lines of, he's like, man, today would be a good day to hit a home run. I was like, yeah, it would be a pretty good cool <laughs> to hit a home run. And my first at bat, I battled and battled and battled and then grounded out. And then but I kind of knew I was on him. And then my second at bat, uh, just got in a hitter's count. He threw a fastball and I took him out to left field. Um, Scout grooved him pretty good and hit a home run off of him, which I think he only gave up like a few that whole season. Um, and I had a pretty good game the rest of the game. It was pretty cool. We played him tough. And then uh, Sunday before the game, uh, Scout came up to me for the first time in my career and tracked me down and introduced himself. His name was Steve Payne. Um, we're still close today. And he said that he was at the game on Friday, saw my hit, and he was actually back on Sunday to see me, which is kind of cool. I was like, wow. Like it's it's kind of ha- it's starting to happen a little bit. Um, I think that was Easter Sunday. We were playing Easter Sunday that year, and it was a critical game. So my mindset was always just win, and just the rest will take care of itself. My dad, my dad always said, good teams have good stats, and bad teams have bad stats. So if you want to have good stats, just focus on winning. So kind of kept that, that in mind. It's a huge game, and I don't. I think I want to say we won that game. I don't remember, but I ended up hitting another home run that day off the oh. kid who ended up being. He was a younger guy, but he went on to have like a really good career and playing pro ball too. And that week he called me, the Marlin scout, Steve, and invited me to their draft workout, um, which was right after the season. And I finished the season on a really good run. Uh, I kind of had the best games of my career, like the last month down the stretch in our playoff chase and ended up getting drafted by the Marlins that year. But to your point, it was, it was just that quick. And to a lot of people, you know, they'd be like, it's an overnight success, you know, like, wow, turning it a home run with a Marlin scout there. And then they drafted him. Um, and you could, I don't like the term luck. People might look at it as luck, but that was years and years of preparation, meeting an opportunity and it kind of coming together into like a successful moment. And, um, so that's, that's kind of what got me to that, you know? So, you know what I find though, when, when you hear a lot of people jump to the conclusion that it was an overnight success, I've found that those people are just using that as a self-defense mechanism because they might not want to put in the work. It's terrifying to put in the work. So it's a lot easier for me to just be like, hey, he just hit one home home run. He got really lucky, but uh, I, I had only hit a double that day. So I'm, I'm a victim. And, you know, that that's why I didn't get drafted. If I hit a home run, I would have. No, you wouldn't have. You, you didn't put in the work for the past seven, ten years. So a lot of people just discount that to overnight success for the sake of their psyche and ego, you know? I agree. And I think – one of the biggest tools to success, you know, this is confidence. And I always love the phrase from Peyton Manning, confidence comes from preparation. So in that moment, when you're facing a guy who throws 98, the reason I was comp, the reason I feel like I had success that day and on Sunday was because I was confident in who I was walking to the box because I knew I had put in more swings that summer than anybody else. I would say in the country, in my mind, I'm sure that maybe that's not necessarily true, but that's the, I was that prepared in my mind to where I felt confident enough to do that, to where a guy who's not prepared walks into the box and he goes, oh my goodness, it's James Karinchak. He's a future big leaguer on the mound. He lost know. already. He's done. Exactly. Exactly. Peyton Manning said that he knew for a fact he was the most prepared person in the NFL each week. So he was the most confident person on the field each week. And I kind of felt, I felt a lot of the same way when I, during my career that I just knew people weren't outworking me. So I felt like it gave me that edge on the field to where I have this incredible advantage over everybody else love that absolutely love that so let's talk about like if you were to kind of we're at the thirty thousand foot view vantage point now looking down you have much more insight right um almost like a hindsight type of view if you were looking at like the jump from college to pro like let's talk defense right like what are some things when you got to the you reported to spring training you were like whoa so you want to know something funny, the, from a hitting standpoint, for me, that was more the, whoa, like these guys are hitting balls to places. I didn't think you were supposed to be hitting balls to like, be, <laughs> like seeing balls go over a batter's eye and mine are like scraping the fence. I was like, all right, like these guys are different, but from the defensive standpoint, I was way, I was very surprised in how little I was like, whoa, um, <laughs> they were great athletes. You know, they were very fast. They're very wiry, but. I was surprised at how much I could hang. And the difference was, is that because when you watch these big league infielders and, and they just seem to never mess up. So you just think they're light years ahead of you. The biggest 
thing I learned very quickly when I got there was that they just had everything down to an absolute science. So like my whole life, you know, and especially in today's generation, everyone's so excited to get into conversations about hitting or throwing programs and weighted balls and this and that, or team defense or bunt plays. And, and then when it comes to infield play, it's just who's the most athletic guy, put him at short, pick up the ball and throw at the first base. Like he's a great shortstop because he's a freak athlete. So you watch a guy like Miggy Rojas and the Marlins organization where I played and everyone's just like, Oh, he's a better athlete than everybody else. So he's playing shortstop in Miami. That's probably all it is. And when I first got drafted, we had a three day draft camp for all the new players to just fully immerse them in all of the lingo with the Marlins. And before he got sent out to the affiliates. So, you knew all the bunt plays and um, the coordinators hitting approach and the defense approach. And we dove fully into infield play and, our infield coordinator is Georgie Hernandez and he had been with the Marlins for like 20 years and he's spoken at ABCA before and he's I was very blessed just to have him as my first coach in pro ball because he's renowned across all of the pro baseball as one of the best infield minds and we spent three days just breaking everything down to an absolute science in the infield to a point that it really allow things to make sense and his biggest thing was footwork patterning he had a lot of other things he would talk about like his hands and when to funnel when to pick but the biggest thing was footwork and I was always a very good infielder growing up in college I made more errors than I ever should have I had a good arm I was athletic and I always worked really hard on footwork and agility in the weight room and in my free time so I could never understand why I was making these errors why my feet were tangled up why with such a good arm, I was making so many throwing errors. And um, I learned very quickly from working with Georgie that I had no sense of footwork patterning. I didn't know what to, what I was supposed to do with my feet on any given play. Um, and when I worked with Georgie very quickly, I got that untangled just from patterning and rep, rep, uh, repetition, learned what it was actually supposed to look like. And that gave me the freedom and the space for my athleticism to kind of take over now because it was working properly as opposed to like a mishmash of junk getting in the way and almost barricading my athleticism and my arm and just putting myself in some really tough positions to make plays. And I always kind of, I like to compare it to hitting and you ask any college hitter, like, Hey man, what are you working on in the cage? They'll, they'll tell you like, um, oh, maybe he's, I'm, I'm trying to get my knob on the ball. I'm trying to shoot from the backside. I'm, working on kill counts or my two strike approach, they can talk about it. I've learned from coaching. And even as a player, if you ask 99.9% .9 of kids in the infield, like, Hey, what's your approach to fielding? Like, what do you mechanically, what are you trying to do? Like almost every time they're like, I don't know. I just try to pick it up and throw it to first base. And that kind of works for some people, but very few, um, if at all. And I learned very quickly from working with Georgie that, that was a problem. I was just putting myself in positions that did not allow me to have success or more, more, a better way of saying this. I just didn't know the proper positions to get into, to make life easier on myself. And um, so, yeah, that was, that was the biggest thing about global was it wasn't that these guys in defense on the defensive side are that much better than me. It's they just know so much more than me that allows them to have more consistent success. So that's amazing. And, 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 I always knew you're going to be a good infielder. When I recruited you, I was like, that kid plays. His actions are awesome. His foot speed has to get better. Um, you were a former goalie, so I was like, he's got good reactions, right? Like, he's got good hand-eye. So, I was like, he's going to be a good fielder. He's going to – and and I always just bet on your work ethic. I was like, this guy – this kid, this kid's family is rock solid. He, he's, everyone's talking about his work ethic. I'm going to bet on him because – Everyone's good in college, but then there's so many other variables that come into play to allow them to be successful that it's it's tough. So if you have a kid who in between the ears is rock solid, you got a good chance. And to that point about infield play, one thing, you know, I definitely learned now is like I was the same way. I was super raw. Like I was run, catch, ball, throw ball. And you know, I think we were both – we had really good coaches and also we were just – students of the game we allowed the game to teach us like if i am making an error consistently in one lane something's wrong like i gotta fix something and that's the biggest part we do where we attack with fast development is bring context to infield play when these kids arrive they have no idea they're like you know they, they'll say all the things like soft hands quick feet attack the ball throw the ball short they'll say all those but it's like pangea they're all separated yeah. they have no idea how one affects the other da 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 and then they, when the game is asking you to 
transition different lanes and postures and cadences and tempos and understand where your hands and feet are, dude, that happens quick. So um, I think there's, we got to do a better job and, and, you know, minds like yourself. Um, and what we're trying to do is create context to infield play because it's friggin' hard. And I think it just gets glossed over. Um, people try to hit the way to college, try and hit their way to the pros, but then what? But then what? Like if you can't if you don't have a position and a lot of kids hit, where are you going then, bud? So I think there's got to be a lot more enthusiasm and commitment to playing good defense and taking a little more pride in that. And uh, I absolutely love, you know, like you were you were in the right spot. You would compete with them. But there, the context was was holding you back from being a good athlete in between the lines, which that's infield play. Go be an athlete. Um that's awesome, man. So what is there any other like when you're thinking about pro ball, is there any other aha moments outside of like footwork patterning? Was there anything that stood out like, dang, I didn't see it that way in college or high school? Yeah, so it all kind of the footwork patterning kind of led to all of that. Um, to touch back on your other point, too, though, like I think there's a lot of people out there, too, who are passionate about it field play and it's not their own fault because that was the same way until i got to the marlins but they don't even there's certain things that they just don't even know so they can teach infield at a high level but there's such a lack of knowledge i think across the general i guess baseball world in infield play like and i always said like it's like they talk about money right like the top like one percent of the world is 99 percent of all the money that's how i feel like it is with big league infield coaches like one percent of coaches have like 99 percent of the of the knowledge and i think the best way would just be to like try and extract that knowledge as much as possible so then people who are passionate on infield can can share it because i see a lot of like really good infield coaches and people who are passionate about teaching infield all over social media and instagram and um and they're doing these drills and like man it's cool they're really focusing on infield but it's actually like wrong so you appreciate the effort and the passion but it's man like i wish like they could spend five minutes with georgie and he would just tell them everything and they can take that passion apply it the right way um and even coaching in the the cape this summer like we had guys from sec schools pac-12 schools and they're like yeah our coach loves defense and i'd be like what do you guys do and he's like oh we just rep out ground balls nonstop every single day i'm like that's great but have you ever heard of like did you know when you feel your left toe is supposed to be up so you can drive the momentum through that left toe? And you're like, wow, no, I never heard that. That's great. And for me, that was like day one with Georgie. So there's people who are really passionate about infield, but there's still so much, I guess, like almost like hidden information that is just at the top level that would be awesome if it could just matriculate its way down through conversations like this or just people sharing it, like ABCA and stuff like that. But um, the biggest aha moment for me is when I was in college, almost every one of my errors was a throwing error. And Georgie had this little saying, he had a lot of cues that we would use, but he always talked about being downhill, which is having your left foot in front of your right foot and your left foot kind of pointed in the direction you wanted to go. So if I was at third, my left foot would be pointed at second. If I was turning to first, if I was getting one towards home, if I was going infield in and not having your feet in a straight line, because if your feet are in a straight line, then you have to cross over. If I cross over now, I'm kind of turned and fighting against my body, which creates like an unravel. And now my my ball's kind of taken off that way. So he would always say, um, when you approach the ball left, right, left, and get in that downhill position, and then right, replace left, so I can work in a straight line. And that was the biggest aha moment for me. I think my junior year at LIU, I had like something absurd. It's even embarrassing to say like 12 to 15 throwing errors because I had good hands and I would just sail the throw, make like a diving play and sail the throw because my feet were always messed up and after one day of working on that with Georgie, getting downhill, left, right, left, and then right, replace left instead of like the giant crossover I was doing. Um, I, I I don't think I made a, like two errors my first year in pro ball and like one, maybe one my first year, like two my second year and no throwing errors the rest of my career. And that was the biggest aha moment to me is like my feet being tangled caused me to make like 30 throwing errors probably in four years at LIU one day of fixing this never made another throwing error again in the last two years of my career. So that was like the biggest aha moment for me. Um, and then it just like kept going from there. Like we had the six different fielding lanes, the five different double play zones, um, drop step drill footwork we would do charge play options you would do. 
we had like three different types of drop step footwork, three different types of charge play footwork, um, double play zones. We would work like 30 minutes a day at, in spring training at second base with like proper footwork around the bag. Uh, I got moved. To, I would work at the first baseman and we would do like 45 minutes a day in spring training of first base specific picks and footwork. And when I played first base in college. I just thought you caught the ball. And so like those little tidbits and like, Every day I was like, man, we're learning more. Like you have another play to work on or you have another footwork pattern to work on. And I was like, this is amazing. Like how much of a science they have it down to. And he would always say, one of my favorite quotes he said was, uh, learn. I'm sorry. He would say, study, learn, forget. So study it. It's going to be very overwhelming, but it's a lot of new information. So study it, learn it. So you know how to do it on your own in the field and get so good at it that you forget it and you forget that you're doing it. So now by the time we do this for months and years, you're at short and you forget what you're doing because it's been drilled so heavily and now it's just muscle memory. Um, I love that. I'm writing it down. And kids need to study first off so they yeah. can can comprehend it. And then they need to forget it. Like you said, it becomes subconscious. It's a habit. Yeah. It's a routine. Um, because I don't think kids study enough. So they like – in, for college, for us, we all learned information, but it was just a textbook. But then we got out into the field and we learned. We got X and O in, in the trenches feedback. And then we forgot it because we've been doing it for so long. And then we had to go back to studying again to learn new things, right? So uh, this uh, so much gold there if you're a uh, father or a mother or just a young kid listening to this. Like just on the throwing stuff. There's so many simple drills to do to help that and, and negate all those throwing errors, like a box drill, right to left, left to target, right, left catch, right to left, left to target, like pre-fielding actions, angles, post-fielding actions. Um, so that's just amazing, Andrew. Like this, there's there's so much to learn that, and I wrote all this stuff down on my little pad right here to take away from this podcast, from in between the ears to on the field, just to insights and perspective. Um you truly do have an awesome, awesome brain and mind for this game and demeanor, and and you care, right? It's all about giving back, making an impact, um, and you're you're going to be an amazing coach in your next step in whatever chapter um, of your life that baseball chooses. And thank you again for your time. I I know you have a social media. We got to get you posting more because you just said it. Don't be a hypocrite. Whatever you got in between the ears, you got to pass down. So. Let the listeners know, like, hey, you can follow me on my my personal handle, and hopefully we're gonna we're gonna poke them to start an infield handle. Yeah, you're right. So it's Andrew Turner, 29. I want to say uh, he doesn't never, even know it. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I I get a lot of DMs and questions. I have tons of videos on my phone, so I'll send them to people. I definitely should post more. I've never been a big social media guy, but Coach Call Noda, out Andrew Turner, 29. Say, make an infield account. If we got to start you on a dig it account, then so be it. Yeah. Um, Andrew Turner, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate you so much, love. Um, always a blast catching up with you, and look forward to talking to you soon. Appreciate it. Thanks again for everything. It's it's awesome what you're doing. I'm pumped to watch it. No doubt.